Uh, good morning everybody. Um, my name is Paul Mitchell um, from Devon and Somerset Farm Rescue Service and I'm joined with my, uh, by my colleague Paul Cross, uh, also from Devon and Somerset. Um, so we were inspected or they had the intervention in October and at the time of the intervention uh, I was the operational safety and assurance manager uh, and following our intervention we've been asked to uh, deliver a presentation on a project uh, that we've been running and it follows a similar vein to Westmids around the issue of competency and I've uh, asked Paul to join me today because Paul's been instrumental in the project, in driving the project uh, and supporting the uh, implementation into uh, the organisation. So I'll hand you over to Paul. There'll be time for uh, co uh, questions, but if you have any questions during the presentation, it's all informal, so please, uh, please ask. Um, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you. It's interesting, isn't it, we're listening to the last presentation. Everybody has got similar issues be it whether you're a Met Brigade or whether you're a more rural brigade like ourselves, and I'll come to that in a second. I'd like to think we've got a silver bullet, whether it, that doesn't exist. So the, you have to be flexible, but I believe there is a common set of principles that you can adopt, which will give you the assurance and the training requirements to make sure that when you send somebody to an incident, Mrs. Miggins is last but 999, then you can respond with the right training, right people, right equipment to get the right result. So that's that common set of principles. So we go on to our journey, which started about three years ago. Uh, we had a, a set of uh, train, we have training centres, we've got uh, a number of trainers, we had a centralised training programme, we got that uh, everything was centralised, everyone would come to ourselves. And was it working? Yes. There is internal and external factors which will change you on your journey. And over the last 20 years, those have been around a little bit, everything seems to be cycling. So you'll do something, it improves, and then we go for a period where it's a little bit more challenging. So if we talk about Devon and Somerset, then we we'll go to the next slide, Paul. This is our area. We've got a different set of challenges to a Met Brigade. We've got 85 stations. And out of those 85 stations set across, across a, a quite a large geographical area from the edge of Cornwall to the edge of Wiltshire to the edge of Dorset to the edge of Avon. So we've got a number of borders. And out of those 85 stations, we've got 15 who are on a, a whole time basis. Still working a 224 system. There are 15 whole time stations. The rest, 75 or so, or 70, <coughs> 70 stations are uh, retained. So what's changed then for ourselves? So we think about, we're gonna go on a history lesson now. This is our training back in the early 80s. Uh, that chap there, he's, he's, just, he's actually just retired, it's Jock Massey, he's a, he's a native of, your, of Scotland, so those who appreciate him. So this is how we delivered our training back in the early 80s. At a training centre, someone's coming to ourselves and we deliver it. This is that same classroom 20 odd years later, what's changed? Nothing. We've got a bit more of a smart board, that's it. So we've upgraded with regards to some of the technology. But in general, nothing has really changed. But something has really changed now, and it's our people. And also, where they live and work. So for ourselves, with the challenges of a retained service, predominantly, people don't actually live in their community or work in their communities any longer, they go further afield to, to, to find work, uh, they've got less time, the pressures of, of, for everybody is out there for, to see. So people haven't got enough, as much time. So this community fire station that used to be the, the hub of the community, where people would organise their training, they would actually get involved in setting up drills, setting up exercises, is no longer available to us. So we have to think differently into the way we've done. And then we add on things for recording. So before we go into what we adopted, and this is just the first part of it, it's what you'll all see, we have recording systems. And what we found with our people is, if we've got less time, they spend a lot of time recording training, and a lot of time filling paperwork in, as opposed to doing practical training, which is a challenge again for all of us, I believe. 
So part of our journey before we start to initiate our project, we adopted the, as most people did, our uh, five professional framework, our set of key icons there, which is our key skills. And so we adopted that into an operational license. Now the operational license, did it work for us? Yes, it gave us some assessment assurance that every, on the, the cycle, whether it's a two year or three year cycle, people will come back to the center and be reset. So they do a bit of training and then you reset the chip, they go away happy as Larry and then go back to their stations. For that moment in time, they're deemed competent. So we've learned something in acquisition and then they come back two years later and they, and they do a, a reset of the chip. In between, we had no real control. Um, we had training material and we had some station-based trainers which were, weren't supported. Uh, and then the maintenance of skills element of it was a little bit wishy-washy, if I'm being honest. And it actually didn't meet our needs. It didn't give us that organizational assurance that we were looking for. So we would pick up some trends through our organizational assurance, operational assurance department, which for me is based on some key pillars. Health and safety events, the learning from, exercises, operational incidents, and any near misses equipment failures. So they're the four pillars I would look for in an operational assurance department. And they feed back in, but the double loop learning wasn't in existence for us. It didn't work for us. So now we move on to three years ago or so, we went into our uh, different projects, which was our training for confidence projects. Then we realized if we do acquisition and we do maintenance against the fire professional framework, what's, what's different? We don't really chain, uh, train and assess against some of the multitude of different hazards and risks that we've got out there. The scenario, the actual environments that we work in. Because what you've got on your fire engine is just a set of tools. We've got, we, we've got a set of skills that we all learn, from breathing apparatus to water rescue to driving. They're only skills. What changes is the environment we go to, whether it's a hazmat, whether it's a water rescue, whether it's a RTC, they're the environments that change. And we weren't really reflecting that in our training. And that brings you down to some of the big events which we've seen in London with high rise. We've got, we haven't got a massive high rise in, in our area, if I'm being honest, but we have got that risk, but not everywhere. So does everyone need to do everything as well? This is a challenge. Does everybody need to have that sheep dip approach to ensuring they can cover every skill? And we said no. It comes up to the different problems again, which is a big incident for ourselves, 25 pumps, which is massive for us, which is the oldest hotel in, in the UK, was. Uh, it's now uh, a, re a renewable uh, um, type of new hotel which has been built. I was going to say car park, but it's not. It's too much. It's in the Cathedral here with Green and Exeter. But again, we, have, we learned some lessons from that, and we're trying to feed that back in now. But that was some of the drivers to our project, which is coming up to the next slide in a second. So we learned something in acquisition. We then come back two years later. And what's changed is we've got less incidents now. We've got limited time for training. There are different types of risk, which brings about more impact for our people, which leads into inefficiencies. Imagine now, we've got 1,500 operational staff all traveling from all parts of, and it's about three and a half hour drive from top to bottom of Devon and Somerset, all come into a center, increased road risk, everyone's hiring a car from the station to get to the, to the venues. We've got obviously fuel costs are going through the roof, and they have to take time off work. And all these things were actually creating a problem for us, and thinking, and they were crying out, saying, I don't want to do it anymore. I just wanted to serve my community and I'll do practical training and do go to shout. So that's why we have the, when we do have our interventions, we have our skill fade right in the middle because there's no interventions between. Take it to the next thing, what we want to achieve is a balancing of this and putting it into trying to flatline it. That's what we're all trying to do, isn't it? So we have our acquisition still, then we have a number of training events. So we can recognize that we have every one of our key skills, not only the BA stuff, but the high rise, the thatch roof for ourselves. We have a number of thatch roofs in the communities we serve. We can have a, a training frequency as well as an assessment frequency. 
And that will be the foundation of what we want to do. So when we do then put in the environmental factors in, we will get less skill fade over those periods of time. Hence the training for confidence, which again did start about three years ago. So I was approached, um, I was a group manager running Somerset Command in our, in our service, and I was asked by the then area manager of the, the training academy, can I come in to head up a project for, to radically change the way we do our business? And there was some radical thought process, and he said, I don't care where we said there's a blank page, and I said, I've heard that before, there's never a blank page. He said, there's not money based, there's always money based. But on this occasion, I have to say, he's now the ACO, he stuck to his words, and yes, there's been some financial constraints that we all have to live with it, but he has let us run right, if you like, with regards to how we change and, and try and solve some of the problems we have. So we want to try and obviously, as the name suggests, right skills, right time, right place, the right standard. And that is a, a really important one as well. So we talk about quality assurance all the way through. Well, I think that will, I'll come on to that in a second. So we then, we produced this and we launched this. If we go back one thing. So then if you click on to the, the bottom of it, go back, next slide. And then go to there. This is what we launched to the to the actual uh, eight five stations at the time. Training for Competence is an organisational project designed to ensure that you're receiving the right training at the right time in the right place to meet the demand quality. The Training for Competence project has been listening to your feedback. You said we can't keep taking time off from our primary employment for training courses. I have to travel too far. Where possible, we bring the academy to you for localised training and assessment. You said we need up-to-date training and assessment material. We will provide high-quality, standardised training content with the most up-to-date information. You said, why do I have to train on risks that are not in my area? We ensure training is themed around the risks and environments you're likely to face operationally. He said, we want to train as a team. We provide local opportunities for team-based training and assessment for your station. You said, I spent too much time updating systems and recording my training. Currently, systems are driving your activity. We'll simplify the recording of assessments to give you more time for practical training. In 2019, we'll be implementing a new training and delivery model with an aim to deliver high-quality training as locally as possible. Each station will have a tailor-made program of training and assessment that takes into account their local risks. Key skills will be determined for each location and role. Your bespoke program will deliver training and assessment that supports you to do your job. We're developing a new electronic skills dashboard that will allow you to easily view your skills status at a glance. We'll remove the need for you to spend so much time recording against statements. We'll free you up to focus your time on high-quality practical training. This is a really exciting prospect to be sure you're given the highest quality training and assessment throughout the year in an environment that allows you to work together as a team, ask questions, and be coached and measured throughout. For further information, please email the Academy Training for Confidence Project team using training for confidence at DS5. So that was the launch. It did set the hairs running, because they're all thinking, what's changing? This really training model, I've heard that, it actually seems to be the way forward for us, certainly for ourselves, but it also seems to be the same for, with, the, with the Met Brigades. With, with what that does for us is it, it does reduce costs. There is some business benefits realization which was built into the project. However, we, uh, uh, we weren't focusing on that per se, it was about the quality of the training material, the quality of the training delivery, uh, and the, in, uh, the outcome, the focus for the, of the end user. When we started the project, when we had the initial scoping doc, uh, uh, meetings with the ACA, it was very much about, this has got to be built for the end user. We've built systems in the past, and we've had a, we've had a horror story, we've had nightmares with it. I still have nightmares on some of the stuff I've seen in the past with regards to the complexity which is built for 